What a great time of worship. I, I meant every word earlier on. You, you all jump right in and you're, you're honoring God when you're, with your heartfelt praise. And God loves to hear our prayers at, in that context too. Wow. Now I'm the, blessed, I'm the most blessed man on the planet Earth, I think, these days. Uh, all my grandkids, all my kids have been here this week. It's been the loudest it's ever been in my home. <laughs> but it's so cool. And, and all of them were here this, in the first service. I don't see any of them. Yeah, so wait a minute, there are three there's three of my, my two, one of my children with her uh, husband and my wife is right over here. And then we've invaded the preschool area with uh, nine kids. So they're over there. So this will be the quietest room on campus right now. I, I'm sure of that. We've had a great time together just enjoying each other's company and, and talking. They were all here. Everybody had their suggestions on what I need to preach on this week. And, uh, and I said, I'll, I'll, we'll determine that later in the Lord. And I, God was working me over on some things, trying to re caused me to remember some things when I was early a, uh, as an, a new believer, and I needed to share these things with you first. But what I want to do is I want to talk to you with this last message I, I've got to speak to you as, as your pastor. I want to talk to you about the kind of faith that lasts. I want to talk to you about what's required for you to get in on the good stuff that God has. I want, I want you to see that God wants to bless you, but in, not in the way that you think. Um, too often we Christians, we act like the hypocrites. You know that. We, we call each other hypocrites. We call ourselves hypocrites. It's because we, our lifestyle doesn't match up to our profession. And, and it frustrates us. It frustrates those around us. Well, having come from an atheistic background, I, you know, it really bothered me when I would run into Christians that were no different than I were. They aspired to do the same things I did. They spoke the same language I did. I mean, they, we went to the same places, went to the same parties. When all of these things happened. And I'm thinking, and then you want me to add Jesus to this formula when it doesn't seem to fit to begin with? And so I, I, just, I was always looking for somebody who actually did believe that stuff. And there was this one guy that did, and he, he was instrumental in my understanding what, what Jesus was all about, uh, this whole thing called salvation. All of that happened. But then I, I noticed, you know, uh, I followed after this one guy. This was one summer in the middle of my college year, years. And, and I used to ask him question after question after question. And he'd just stay up late at night and answer all these questions. And then finally I went, went back to Georgia Tech thinking there's not a single Christian in all of Atlanta, Georgia. Because I'd been there the previous year looking for people who would claim to be Christians. And everyone I did, I found, we'd talk and then they would pretty much say, well, I don't believe that stuff anymore. My parents believed it. And so again, it was just reaffirming my faith as an, you know, I'm saying, here I'm an atheist. And so I go back to Georgia Tech and I'm looking for somebody who will actually stand up. And I, I found, ran into a couple guys who really had this passion for God, who really wanted to go one step deeper. They, they weren't satisfied with just the status quo when it comes to Christianity. They, they wanted everything that the God's word had promised that we could have. And so um, I, followed after, I followed them, asked them all kinds of questions. I was pro-Jesus at the time but I was anti-church because the church made up those people who were the hypocrites and I didn't want to be around them. So when people would invite me to their church, I'd say, no, nah, I don't want what they got. I want the stuff that you got. And he says, well, we got that. He said, no. Nah. So after a while, he pestered me enough times, he finally invited me to his church and his church was just two blocks away from the Georgia Tech campus. It was First Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia, where Charles Stanley is the pastor. And so he, he invited me to come. I went and I, and I heard him and I thought, this pastor knows God. This pastor is not willing to settle for all the excuses that we Christians give. He says, this guy knows what he's talking about. And so I wanted to go there. I kept going there and I, and I grew in that church. That's my first church I ever really was a part of from being a believer anyway. So all of that to say, I, I want you to know that, that when I saw this guy named Charles Stanley and him represent God in ways that are different than normal, I thought, I want to, I want to have this. I want to know the same God that he's talking about. So that's what I, where I am right now. There was, a, there was a title to a message that Charles Stanley used during that period of time, and I've used it for the title of my message today, and it's entitled, Dis Disciplined for Deeper Devotion. Disciplined for Deeper Devotion. And what, what I mean by that is this, there's, there's much more to it, and so we need, to, we need to discipline ourselves to go deeper. Now, how do I know that's even necessary? Well, there's a passage of Scripture in 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 7, that pretty much lays the foundation for this train of thought. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7 says, On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. 
For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So, so what Paul's telling Timothy is this. Timothy, you get it. You know how exercise benefits your body physically. You walk, you run, you do all these kind of things. You, you're lifting things. It causes you to be strong, and all those things are necessary. You, you have to discipline yourself in those things, though. You can't just randomly decide that today you're going to pick up some object that weighs 1,000 pounds. You're not going to do it. You have to work your way up from the one pound to the five pounds, and, and then you know how much you can pick. You can do, but that's discipline. It requires discipline. What Paul is telling Timothy is the same truth applies to your godliness. Now, what is godliness? Godliness means that you represent the, God, the one who's godly. It means that you emulate the one who is godly, which is, we're talking about God. Godliness means that you're becoming much more like God. That's godliness. All of those shades of meaning deal with this word godliness. So what he's saying here is, you and I, we have to exercise disciplines that will lead us to that depth of maturity, of, of spiritual maturity. And it's God's way of saying, there's so much more. There's so much more. So what are those things? I thought as your pastor, that you know, I've been sharing these kind of truths with you for a long time, for 24 or five years. Now, and, and I, what I want to do is, is take some of the highlights. I, I wanna, there, are, there are eight disciplines, nine disciplines that I want to highlight for you today that I, if you'll take any one of these and start working on them, you're going to notice a significant change in your godliness factor. You're going to notice a significant difference in the way that you approach God, the way that you deal with God, the way that you talk about God when you start disciplining yourself for godliness. It, it just happens. So I want us to go down that road, of, and we're going to look at uh, nine of them, only because I know you're disappointed if, it, if it's anything less than five. You know, you need far more for, from me. So that way you can work on it. So if you got your, your note sheet, pull out your note sheet, and I want you to write down first. This is the first discipline that develops godliness, and that's this. Live with a sense of calling. Live with a sense of calling. In other words, your life is meant to count. When God created you, he had something on his mind that he wanted you to apply yourself to. He wants you to be disciplined in this one area. You're made with a purpose. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9, one of my favorite passages, clarifies this kind of calling with one word. Look at verse, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into, what's the word there? fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The, the key word there is fellowship. You are called into fellowship. What's that word fellowship? What does that mean? It's that Greek word koinonia that means intimacy. It means that you're willing to share your life with this person. This person is willing to share their life with you. God says, I have created you uniquely that you and I would be intimately acquainted with each other. That's what your calling is. Your calling is to be in fellowship with the living God. It's not one of those things where you're down here on earth and he's way up there in heaven somewhere and you hope that he doesn't watch you because you're afraid that you're going to do something wrong while he's watching. He says, I've called you with the intent of being in eye contact with each other. I want you to be, I want you to be there and intimately acquainted with me. But you know what happens, unfortunately? You're introduced to that kind of relationship and then you begin to think that it's because you're so spiritual. It's because that you're so nice to certain people and because you've done a lot of good deeds and God says, you need to watch your attitude. I mean, you want, you want, something, to, you want something to come in and destroy that, that koinonia? Well, start getting arrogant, start getting boastful and proud. In fact, uh, let, me, let me show you a passage, another passage that kind of spells that out. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says to the church at Ephesus, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. So he's acknowledging you have a call. He says, but you need to walk consistently. Don't accept hypocrisy as an alternative. Hypocrisy is not a viable alternative. He says, go on, you need to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance with one, for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Again, here's Paul saying, I know if left to yourself, if you let the flesh loose in your life, you're going to go around with your head cocked around and looking around like I'm better than you are. He says, you can't go down that road. Because once you go down that road, you are eroding the very koinonia that you're seeking to build. 
Now, how long is this going to last? Well, let me tell you what Paul said. Paul said in Philippians 1, verse 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God wants you to know that even though he called you, you are still a work in progress. And you have not arrived by any stretch of the imagination. He says, but I'm not going to hold that against you. I'm going to continue to work on you and work on you and work on you until it's time for me to come back. And then when I come back, you'll be finished. You'll be ready. He says, so you need to hang in there. You need to cooperate with me. You need to be willing to discipline yourself for devotion here. Now, that brings me to number two. The second discipline. Be on the lookout for divine interruptions. Be on the lookout for divine interruptions. God plans interruptions. God wants to stop you in your tracks on occasion. God wants you to take a sharp right-hand turn on occasion. And he's not going to wait to consult with you about it. Sometimes he will bump you in the direction you need to go. And you're saying, what is going on here? God, leave me alone. And God says, I'm simply working on you. So that brings me, obviously, to Proverbs 16 and 9. Proverbs 19, 9, 16, 9 says, The mind of man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. God wants you to make plans. God wants you to lay it all out there to help you make progress. He says, but be alert and always be open to God's interruptions. You're going to make those plans, but when you start implementing the plans, don't be shocked when God steps in the middle of them and starts reworking them and do, does something different. We hate that. I know, I'm with you. I hate it when God does those kind of things. But I have to acknowledge and take a step back and acknowledge that he knows best. And he knows that if I keep going down the road I'm going down, that it's going to hurt me rather than help me. It's going to mess up his plan for my life rather than assist me to being right in the dead center in the, in the middle of his plan for my life. All of this is so important. God says, I want you to be on the lookout for these divine interruptions so you're not taken by surprise. I want you to know that God will use these interruptions. James chapter 1, verse 2, it's right there in your notes there. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various interruptions, trials, tribulations, temptations. All of those words can be rightfully translated here for that one word. He said, I want you to know, you don't be surprised if you're interrupted, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Those interruptions do test your faith and it makes you mad at God. If it's, not, if it's not doing it the way you would say it needs to be done. And then verse 4 says, And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, God just wants you to be fully developed. God wants you to, to grow in, in, in godliness, and He wants you to arrive. He doesn't want you just to always be hanging out there in limbo, saying, one of these days, hopefully, I'll get a little closer as a godly person. No. God says, you need to be on the lookout for divine appointments, and pay attention. When God says, stop, stop. But God is part of my plan. I'm changing your plan right now. Do what I say. Be prepared for God's interruption. Number three, the third discipline. Live like today matters. Live like today matters. Like this is the only day you're guaranteed. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're certainly not guaranteed next week. You're guaranteed today. John, 4, John 9, verse 4. Jesus says, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it's a day. Night is coming when no one can work. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples. He's saying, listen, you need to make the most of this moment. This moment called today. Even the psalmist, Psalm 90, verse 12 says, so num teach us to number our days so that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. When you make like every day counts, what you're doing is honoring God. You're saying to God, this is no accident that you've called me given me a purpose for a living, but it's also no accident that I'm here at this place at this time. God says, that's exactly right. I want you to know that when you cooperate with me, when you live like today matters, it develops within you this understanding of life. You begin to understand a little bit more clearly what God is trying to teach you. Let, let me give you one more verse. Ephesians 5, verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. L let me add one other thing here for you. If you're going to make like today matters, 
and you're going to use that as a discipline in your life for you to become more godly, then what you need to do is record the things that God teaches you along the way. Today, this is Sunday, when throughout the course of the day, you're going to be learning some things from the Lord. And you're going to think, well, I, I don't know. See, if you pay attention, that's, what, that's the whole message here is, is us learning to discipline ourselves, to pay attention to God. When you pay attention to God, God is going to be teaching you some things and you need to jot them down. And then, you need to get, then a few days later, you can go back over and read what, what God taught you two days ago. But this is more, more than that. God wants you to take those things that you're articulating, the lessons that you're learning from God, and pass them on to others. You become more godly when you emulate godliness, especially as it comes to talking about the things that God is up to. God wants to be known. He wants you to emulate him through your lifestyle, but also through your writing, through your, your conversations, all of that. God says, I want this to be a vital part of your life. Live like today matters. Then, number four, take the initiative and start spiritual conversations today. Take the initiative and start spiritual conversations today. In other words, instead of saying, well, when I get around to it or when there's a better situation or when they bring it up, then I'll do it. No, no. God says, I want you to initiate the conversation, the spiritual conversations. He says, I know you feel uncomfortable about some of that, but he says, you need to do it anyway, because who better knows your story than you? You know what God's done in your life. You know how God has changed you. You know how God has forgiven you of your sins. You know all those things. Others don't have a clue of what could be until you come and tell them, here's what has been in me. So God says, I want this to be a vital part of your life. I want you to take the initiative and start talking to people about what Jesus did. Well, what did he do? He died on the cross. Why? Because our sins have to be paid for. There's a debt we owe. So Jesus came to this earth, became a man just so he could die in our place. Why would he want to do that? Because he's God. He is, and he's known as the God who is love. He really does love you, even when you are unlovable. I want you to look at the person beside you. Think of God loves them even when they're unlovable. You see that? They're right there beside you. If God will love the unlovable ones beside you, he will surely love the unlovable ones that you run into. And God says that's why you need to start the conversation. Start the conversation and say, listen, I have run into this God named Jesus who has forgiven me of my sin. Don't be surprised when they say you think he'd do it for me. He would. But they won't know it unless you tell them. Start, take the initiative. There are so many places throughout the scriptures that deal with that very thing here. This one discipline of sharing your faith, this one discipline of passing on the information that you have about Jesus and saying, this is what he did in my life. The, the personal testimony. That's what God wants. Listen to this. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5, 18, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He says, you've experienced reconciliation. Now I want you to go and help others to experience the same thing. That's what he's saying right here. Matthew the, one of the disciples was approached by Jesus. Jesus said, I want you to follow me. And here's what he said, Matthew 4, 19. He said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of dinosaurs. <laughs> Doesn't say that, does it? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What does that mean? It means that he's going to send you out to, to where there are pools of men and women. It's talking about mankind here. But he, he said, I'm going to send you out to where people are and I want you to start a conversation about Jesus. And if they want, if they're interested in receiving Christ right there, you introduce them to Jesus right then. That's what this is about. Solomon said it this way, Proverbs 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. If, if God says the wise ones are the ones who win souls, then what should we be doing? If you're going to be wise, it's going to be because, it's because you are sharing the gospel. How about Luke? Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, but he also wrote Acts. And he put in here one of those great commission statements. This is Jesus. He was standing there giving some last minute instructions before he ascends into heaven. And here's what Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. He says you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. When does that happen? 
the moment you open up and receive God's gift of life that he offers you. And he's already offered it to you, so he's just waiting for you to accept the gift. But when you accept the gift, part of the gift is the very person of God, the Holy Spirit. And, the, and that's what he's talking about here. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you after you've responded to him. So every believer, every Christian who's received Christ has now power, but the power comes from the Holy Spirit of God who's taken up residence in you. In fact, later on in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians, it talks about your body is the temple of the living God. That's why he says, take care of it. But that's all part of disciplining yourself for deeper devotion. Let me give you one more. Simon Peter. Peter put it this way. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Again, Peter said, be ready. Some people you won't be expecting. They'll just show up and then I say, oh, here's a person I could share, share Jesus with. But some of the people you won't have any idea who they'll be until something happens, one of the interruptions. Now that brings me to number five, the fifth way to discipline your life for d- deeper devotion. Treat people with grace. Treat people with grace. How do you treat people right now? When you're hungry and you're tired, how do you treat people around you? Oh, it's different, is it? Of course it is. You know, you've been on both sides of that coin. And God says, I want you to treat people with grace, always. God does. He's a God that's full of grace and mercy, full of love. He never sacrifices any of those or changes any of those for the sake of any other characteristic. Though it's true, he loves, but he also says he judges. I mean, there's, there's, God is the total package. He's always consistent. He loves you, but it doesn't mean he puts up with sin. He doesn't. He doesn't tolerate sin. He says you deal with sin. How? By confessing it. When you confess your sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's, that's God. So what does God tell us? He says, in your relationship with others, I don't care how you feel. He says, I want you to treat them this way. Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You want to know how God wants you to treat those that are sitting next to you here? You want to know how God wants you to treat those people that you're going to go home to after the service? You want to know how God wants you to treat people in general? This way. He wants, he wants you leaning in the direction of forgiveness. Yeah, but they don't deserve to be forgiven. Yeah, you didn't either. I didn't either. But God is so cool. God is so like God, that he would shower us with grace and mercy at our least wanted time. Ephesians 4, 29. Some of you, maybe the issue is your speech, the way you talk around people. Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. I I believe that no unwholesome word means all. He says, don't let it ever happen. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. This isn't me speaking here, gang. This is God. God says your language, the things that you talk about, the things that you say to other people really mean something to God. Why? Because God has called you to himself. He has called you to live a life that's in fellowship with him. And when you're living a life that's in fellowship with him, there are certain behaviors, certain languages that are just not tolerable by God. God says, I want them to emulate me. I want your conversations to be sort of what I would talk about, says God. God says, this is all really important. We need to treat people with grace. Then go to number six, the sixth discipline. Align your faith with the truth of God's word. Align your faith with the truth of God's word. In other words, faith is not about feelings. There are a lot of people who feel like they've got all the faith in the world just be, for, for whatever reason. The good times are happening in their life and say, I've got all this faith. Well, you need to know your faith has nothing to do with your feelings about faith. There are feelings that follow faith, but don't confuse faith with the feelings. God wants you to, to, to operate on the basis of faith. The Bible says we're to walk by faith, not by sight. So how do you do that? Well, the Bible defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Which, and, and that verse, I didn't give the verse to, so don't, guys, don't get confused. I threw this one in. This is free. This is just a freebie. 
But I want you to know when, when you're walking by faith, faith is essentially this. Faith is substance of things hoped for, which means there's, a, there's something there that you can get your hands on. What is the substance of faith? The Word of God. And it's the evidence of things not seen, which is an indicator that you take the truth of the Word of God and you act on it. You, you do what it says, therefore you leave tracks in the sand. Evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what does that got to do with this? God wants you to take all of your faith and align it with God's truth. He doesn't want you to be drifting off course simply because you feel like faith is right there. It's, that's, it's not. God says, I want you to find out what I say in my word and then act on it. And at that moment, you are then walking by faith, not by sight. There's much here in the scriptures that deal with this. If you're, if you're wondering why would he prescribe such a thing, why does he want you to start with the scriptures? Why can't he just start with, just tell us what to do and we go and do it? That's, that's the point. He wants you to know what he's telling you to do. Listen to this. Hebrews 4, verse 12. It says, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's pretty sharp. It says, and it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit. That's pretty tight. And it says, of both joint and marrow. I mean, there, there's just a little bit of distance there. And he says, and able, God's word is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So every, all those things that you're thinking in your mind that you, you're glad that nobody else can know that you're, you're thinking, you need to know that God's Word exposes that. When you get into God's Word, all of a sudden He's going to use it like a, a flashlight and use it to shine on those things that you thought were hidden from God, you thought were going to be okay. And here's God saying, no, I want you to align your faith with the truth. He says it may be painful, it may be difficult, but I want you to align your faith with my Word. Another way to put that would be what James said, James 1.22 says, but prove yourselves doers of the, the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. God is really concerned about us walking by faith. Now let's go to number seven. Number seven, and this should be quite obvious what I, what I mean by this. Pray like your life depends on it. Pray like your life depends on it. Pray like it's a 911 call. God, you better do something here or we're in trouble. God, please step in here and intervene. Throw in an interruption anytime you want to, God. Go ahead. I don't know where I see we're going. It's going to be very painful, so help me out here. That's what God's saying. I want you to pray like your life depends on it. And why do we say that? Why is that important? Why is that a discipline that needs to be uh, dug deeper? It's because the Scripture talks about prayer being the alternative. He says, you, you get worried. You're anxious you're not sure what to believe. And he says, well, don't be anxious about anything, but instead pray, right? I mean, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't quench the Spirit. The passage I was just talking to you about a moment ago, Philippians 4, verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when you do that, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is God's way of saying, you need to pray like your life depends on it. Instead of gritting your teeth and hanging in there for daily life and buckling in another buckle and hoping that you survive, God says, trust me, talk to me, talk to me. And I've told you this before, Prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a dialogue. You don't just throw things out God's way and say, I'm glad you got it. Now you go do your life. No, God says, I want that prayer to be a, a dialogue where you share with him and then he shares with you and you interact with each other. Just a general conversation. Well, what's God going to say? Is he, does that mean he's going to speak out loud to you? He might, but I, I doubt it. More than likely, he's going to use his word that he's already spoken. And as you're reading through God's word, you're going to see what God says about your situation. That's why it's so important you get into God's Word. That's why you line up your faith with God's Word. They're all related, but it is a discipline. If you don't discipline your do it, yourself to do it, it won't get done. And you're going to fool yourself into thinking that you're pretty godly when all you are is a hypocrite. Then that brings me to number eight. Never forget who God is. Never forget who God is. I think that's one of our greatest problems is that we see God as the Santa Claus. You tell God what you want and you expect God to give you what you want. You get upset with God when he doesn't give you what you want. 
So you keep asking him for things that you want. And then you think, but I don't want to bother him with the little things, so I don't ask him about those. But he says to pray about everything. Is don't be anxious, but to pray about everything. So, so what's the big deal? What does this never forget who God is? The whole point of this interaction, of this call to koinonia, is, is all about two different distinct people coming together and relating to each other. God says, I want you to know me. I already know you. I made you for myself. He says, but I want you to never forget who I am because you are in relationship with me, God. So who am I? Well, that that reminds me of when Moses was in the wilderness. He had to flee for his life because he killed an Egyptian. So now he's 80 years old and he's shepherding sheep and comes across this bush, this bush that's on fire, but it doesn't burn completely up. And so you got, a, you got Moses looking and saying, what is that? That's a bell. Hmm. Did an angel just get his wings? Is that what that was? Maybe. I don't think so. Um, anyway, Moses, where are we? Uh, only on my last Sunday. <laughs> Moses, he's in the wilderness, sees this fire. And they're talking and God says, I'm going to send you back. Uh, to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell him that God wants them, him to let them free. He, and he's thinking, there's no way I can do that. So he comes up with all these excuses, and, and then finally none of those excuses work, and finally comes up with what he considers to be a, a viable excuse. He says, look, okay, I'm going to go tell the Israeli leaders that are back there what, what you told me. You know what they're going to do? They're going to ask me, yeah, right, who is this God that you're talking about? What, I mean, if they ask me what your name is, what am I supposed to say? Because I really don't know you, and I don't know your name. I mean, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? Well, Exodus 3, verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to them, to you. But they may say to me, What is the, his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am. I am is the word Yahweh. The, and when people were reading that, you know, there's some discussion about that, you know. Um, they're not sure exactly what to call it. Is it Jehovah or Yahweh? It's the, same, it's the same consonants, but not the same vowels. But the vowels were added to the text about 1,000 years after the text was written. So there, and, and Jewish folks, when they would pray, they would never say the word of God, even though they'd come to the word and they'd read off their prayers. When they got to the word God, they would not say it because it's too holy for them to say so we're really not sure which, how to pronounce the, the word. It's Yahweh or Jehovah, one of the two. But, but the, the point is not so much about that as it is God wants you to know him enough that he's willing to reveal himself. Jehovah, is, there's usually a compound part of this name. It'll be Jehovah Jireh, which means the God who provides. Or Jehovah Shammah, the God who is near, the God who is, is present. Or, or Jehovah Rapha, the God, our healer. I mean, all that. Why, why is that important? Because when you're trying to talk to a person about the living God, you want them to get off this kick that says God is, is something out there. God is a person. And he reveals himself by name. So, so that's where the intimacy comes in. He wants you to know him intimately. So he reveals you by name, by his name. So when Abraham is offering his son up on the altar, you're wondering, why would God ask him to do that? To teach him a lesson about who he is. So they get up to the top, and they, he lays out all the, food, the, uh, the wood for the altar, and he takes his son and binds his hands and lays him on the altar. He's going to offer his son as a sacrifice because God told him to go up the mountain and do that. And then, then right before he did it, God spoke out and says, stop. Wanted to see if you would do that. He says, no, I don't want you to offer him. I want you to know my name is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Your sacrifice, your sacrificial lamb is right over here. I've provided him to you. So how did God deal with Abraham in that case? By revealing who he was. He's consistently Jehovah Jireh. This was the first time that that ever happened. But that's how God is. He wants you to never forget. Now why? Listen to this. Jeremiah 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not a mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. And let him who boasts, boasts of this. So he says, all these things, I don't want you talking so highly about, it's not about wisdom, it's not about strength, it's, it's not about uh, might. He says, but let him who boasts, boasts of this, 
that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. God says, you want to do some bragging? You want to talk about what's really, what, what God would like for you to talk about? He says, I want you to stop talking about how rich you are, how wealthy you are, how physically fit you are. He says, instead, I want you to start talking about how godly you are. And that godliness can be measured by the intimacy factor. Do you see God as a person to relate to or just a, a thing, an object to get things from? So we need to ask ourselves those tough questions. Here he's saying, if you're going to boast about anything, boast in this, that you understand and know me. Those are two different words, by the way. Understanding is the word sakal, which means intellectually assent you, to the facts. You, you, you look, you see the facts, but then knowing is when you actually experience the truth personally. Then you, you say, I know. So he wants you to understand and he wants you to know. The, the knowing comes as a byproduct of the understanding. So you can't, you can't leave out the understanding and all of a sudden jump to the knowing. God says the numbing comes because, the knowing comes because uh, of the understanding. Now that brings me to the last, discipline. Love God by obeying God. Love God by obeying God. You remember Jesus was confronted and approached on numerous occasions by the religious leaders and they all said something like this, what's really the most important law? What do you think should be at the top of our to-do list? I mean, what, which is more important? And Jesus' answer was always the same. Number one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Number two, if you're asking, is that you love your neighbor as yourself. But, but what's important here is number one. He says, I want you to know that that's really at the heart of where God is. He wants you to know him intimately. He wants you to know him here. However, and that's all the uh, same thing in the Old Testament too, uh, I don't want you to think it's exclusively here in the New Testament when Jesus is talking. And in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. So what, what's, what's the big deal here? What, what's, what's he trying to teach us here? It's easy to say we love God. And Jesus even says that's what's most important. You want to know what bottom line is? You want to know what God wants from you more than anything else? He wants you to love him above all other things. Here's the secondary question. How do you know if you love him? How do you know your love is not just a feeling? Because love is so much more than feelings. How do you know? How can you know? Well, fortunately for us, the scripture doesn't leave us to guess that. Here's what the scripture says. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. John 14, verse 21. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. Do you hear what it's saying there? It's saying if you take the time to gather his commandments, the scripture, the word, and, and begin to process that, he says, when you do that, what, uh, you, the natural thing you'll want to do is to apply it. He says, but at that moment, when you're beginning to take God's word and dig in, he says, you're saying to God, I really do love you. I love you enough to know what you say. I love you enough to take the initiative and, and find out what you say. And, and, the, and Jesus went on. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. He's talking about the koinonia. He's saying, you don't understand. When, when you don't want to obey me because you, it, it's, it's going to cost you something. It's going to be painful. But he says, but if you are willing to obey me, even in that area of pain, you're going to see that the Father is just going to lavish his love on you. And I am going to lavish my love on you. And then it closes. says, and I will disclose myself to him. Again, we're back to the koinonia. It's all about God wants you to know who he is. God is God. He's not just an alternative to turn to. There is no one like God other than God. That's God. But we need to make sure we treat him like that. If, if loving God means obeying God, then how good are we at obeying God? Charles Stanley was my pastor. I mentioned that a moment ago. He was in the hospital for a couple of weeks when I was in college. And it happened about every year. And, he, and they, the doctor said he just overworked and he, he, was just, he needed to temper his schedule some. But he came back, he'd been in the hospital two, year, two weeks, came and spoke the next Sunday. And while he was there, he said that the Lord had whipped him. 
given him a spanking and taught him how he had, got, he had abused his calendar and his schedule and he, he needs to listen to God. And, and, uh, and God began to speak to them there in the hospital and he jotted down these eight truths that you need to apply to your life if you want to know that you're making Jesus Lord of your life. He came back and preached that message. And when he did, I thought, that just rung all the bells for me. I thought, that's it. That's cool. And so since that time, I've always had a list of these eight things that you have in your note sheet there. I always keep a list of that on the inside cover of my Bible. Now, here's my Bible that I use now. And on the inside, I just I, I tape it. And these are those eight truths that are there in your note sheet. But I wanted you to have this because this will radically revolutionize your obedience to God. And, and I want you to have it so much so that when you walk out the door in a minute, don't miss this. We have a little laminated card with all of them on it. All right, so that way you can keep it on your, dry, on your glove compartment or wherever you need to, to be looking at it and say, hmm, to evaluate your quest for godliness. Now, let me just read through it. Because I, I, I know it, if we don't do it now, it may be next week before you say, oh, there's that card. Jesus is Lord of my life when I obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit without arguing and fighting back. Jesus is Lord of my life when I am committed to doing His will before I know what it is. Jesus is Lord of my life when I am available to serve Him without regard to the time or place or requirements. Jesus is Lord of my life when pleasing Him takes priority over pleasing all others. Jesus is Lord of my life when I acknowledge and recognize Him as the source of all my desires and needs. Jesus is Lord of my life when I submit to his ownership and possession of all I am and all I have or possess. Jesus is Lord of my life when it's the pattern of my life to turn my failures and my defeats and difficulties into opportunities for spiritual growth. And finally, Jesus is Lord of my life when to know him intimately becomes the obsession of my life. Align your life with these statements and ask God, to help you see clearly. Ultimately, you want to be godly. You want to work on those spiritual muscles where you can develop and you can, you can uh, bench press far more this year, spiritually speaking, than you did last year. You want to be able to do that? You're going to have to answer these questions honestly. And if you do, God's going to begin to do a work in your life. It's going to ramp up the number of interruptions. I hate to tell you that. But He knows best. And if you stay on the course that you're on, you're going to be hurting. God says, I want you to get off the throne of your life and let me on that throne. Now, before we wrap up here, I want to ask you a couple questions. Question number one, do you believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for you on a cross, to pay for your sins? You don't have to say it out loud, just what you need to be thinking. I want to, thinking yes or no. Second question, do you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and he was raised from the dead in order to offer us life, to conquer death? Do you believe that? Well, it's the truth, and those are two truths that God has given us constantly in his word. He says, you need to know that these are foundational. But the third question is this, have you acted on that truth? Have you accepted the gift? God says, as many as received him, to them he gave the the gift of eternal life. God says, I want you to know, I'm, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's verse after verse after verse that, that says there's how you apply that. So let me ask you, have you done that yet? Many of you have, but some of you haven't. John just recently did. And the first step of obedience, remember, if you love Jesus, you're going to obey him. First step of obedience, when you trust Christ, when you accept his offer, is you set up a time for baptism. Because that's the outward sign. That's how you present yourself and say, I've given my life to Christ. I'm one of those believers. If you've not done that, you need to say, I want to do that. You need to set it up. We'll baptize people every Sunday. with Both services, if we have that many people. So... Are you ready to do that? We need to act and live like today matters. Remember, one of the points, one of the disciplines. God says, quit putting it off. If you've not done that, you need to do it now. In fact, if, we're not going to go any further until I lead us in a moment of prayer, just for that very thing. If you're ready to receive the gift that God offers, 
I want you to pray this prayer with me. I'll pray it out loud. You pray it in your heart. Everybody else, pray for the people around you right now. Just pray. Dear God, I am a sinner. And I believe that Jesus, when he came to this earth, offered his life as a, a sacrifice for my sin. Thank you for that. I didn't deserve that, but I'm sure glad you did it. And Jesus, I believe that you were raised from the dead after the third day, and now you, you live a resurrected life, and you've conquered death, and now you offer us that resurrected life. Thank you for that. Again, we don't deserve it, but we're so good, glad you offer it. But we also know, Lord, that you're waiting for us to act on those truths. And so right now, we know that you're offering us a gift of life that includes forgiveness of our sin and eternal life, a quality of living. Lord, we accept your gift and we resolve to do and to live a life that honors you for the rest of our lives. We give you what's left of our lives. We want you to be pleased with it. We choose right now to step off the throne of our life and we enthrone you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. God, we can't wait to see what's going to happen next. Amen. Now, let me just say, if you prayed that with me, God heard you. You made the most of Monday, of this day. You made the most of it. And it's going to change your whole life. God has already begun a new work in you. He lives within you. And you can expect him to begin to direct you. And the end product will be more godly. God wants you to become more like him. God wants you to know him so well that you can pass him on to others. That's what it means to be godly. God says, I want you to be godly. You've just started that journey. If you need to be baptized, at the end of the service, I'll be up here at the front. You come let me know. But just take one of the cards on the chair, uh, a seat in front of you, and write it down. I want to be baptized. Write down the date that you'd like to, and we'll call you and set it up. But you need to take the next step so we know how, to, how we can help you. If you've already gone and done all of that, then it's time for you to resolve to discipline yourself for devotion of God. This is the time to say to God, I'm all in, and I'm going to do it your way. Thank you, O oh God. Again, the bells ring at the time when you need to say, yes, God. So let's, let's do, let, I want to offer one more prayer before we wrap this up. Father, I know when you look down and you see all the folks that are in this room, you see a lot of people that belong to you. A lot of people that have started the journey and they've encountered those interruptions, but they've also encountered the koinonia. Thank you, Father, for that. We know, know that we oftentimes disappoint you when we choose to sit on the throne of our life. I'm asking you, Lord, to help us to dethrone ourselves. Give us the courage to step off the throne and offer the throne to you. You are our Lord. And Lord, we want to live a life that, re that looks like that. So please help us, Lord, to live in a way that honors you. I, I bless your holy name. There's nobody like you. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now listen, gang, I love being your pastor. What I love most about you is you're hungry and thirsty for the things of God. The next pastor that you, you hit as your lead pastor, he's going to be shaking his head saying, wow, I hit the lottery. I mean, we don't play the lottery, by the way. <laughs> but, but I'm just telling you, they're going to feel like they got it all. It's going to be a wonderful thing. You guys know how to love. You guys know how to receive people. You know how to walk beside people. You are such an encouragement. You've done that with me, your pastor, but you've done it with each other. Don't stop. Please don't stop. I've loved being your pastor, and I, you know, I'm just, I believe God's in this transition time. There's no, nothing, no doubts in my mind about that, but it's hard still transitioning, and I will definitely miss seeing you week after week after week. I like that, but uh, I, we're sticking around, and so I will be seeing you just to make sure that you are becoming more godly. You know, I want to hang. So anyway, I love y'all. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. I love you too. You know what it means. The doors are open. So go tell somebody about Jesus, but don't forget your little card, okay? It'll remind you. I love you. Bye.